Uh, well, thank you, Peter, for that very nice introduction. Thank you, Penny and Energizing Communities, for making this trip possible. Thank all of you for taking time out of your day uh, to spend some time together thinking about this universe of uh, local investment. I, I should say, just to put this all in perspective, um, I, I, as, as Peter mentioned, I've written three books on local economies. The first book came out in 1998 called Going Local. And it was so popular, the discourse around local economies was so popular then that the first place that I went to was the University of Kentucky. Two people showed up. <laughs> One left early. <laughs> and I think it's, you know, to me it's been heartening that, you know, if you stick with something after such an inauspicious beginning, uh, for so many years and it doesn't work, you're going to be institutionalized. And yet somehow this has managed to get traction and the spread of the transition towns movement, local economies, local investing, local food is I think a testament to uh, the time is right for all of this. Where I want to begin is just a little bit of review of things that you probably know already, at least intuitively, but it's good to put labels on it. And that is, what are we trying to do in the economy? Most of economic development these days, in your country and in mine, is focused on attraction and retention of business. I was just at a conference of Australian EDA, and you could count a baud rate of about once a minute the words attract and retain would come out of every speaker's mouth. What's odd about that formulation is you cannot attract a non-local business, a, a local business rather. It's an oxymoron to attract a local business. A local business has to grow locally. And if the only way you retain a local business is by paying it a bribe, how local is it? How deep are those roots? So to me, it is a reminder that we need a very different approach to nurture local businesses. And local businesses, I think, are critical for these reasons. I believe you can make a case that the strongest communities are ones that, A, maximize local ownership of all business. Number two, are as self-reliant as possible. And number three, spread great models of triple bottom line success. So I want to talk briefly about each of these before diving into the universe of local investment. So first of all, why does ownership matter? The basic reason is locally owned businesses spend more of their money locally and thereby pump up the so-called economic multiplier. This is a study fairly famous in the United States done almost a decade ago in Austin, Texas, comparing the impact of $100 spent at a Borders bookstore, that's in the red, non-local, recently bankrupt, comparing that with $100 spent at a local bookstore. $100 spent at the borders left $13 in the local economy. $100 spent at the local bookstore left $45. So roughly speaking, you buy the same book at the same price at the local bookstore, and the community gets three times the jobs, three times the income and the wealth effects, three times the tax collections, three times the charitable contributions. We're not talking about small degrees of difference. Why is there this difference? Well, the borders did not have a high level management team on the ground. The local bookstore did. The borders did not use local accountants and lawyers and business services. The local bookstore did. The borders did not advertise on local radio and TV. The local bookstore did. The borders did not have a stream of profits coming into the community. The local bookstore did. So if you could generalize from those line items, 
you would say it would be a really unusual comparison between two similar businesses, one local, one not local, where you would get a higher economic multiplier from the non-local business. And in point of fact, we have about two dozen studies that have been done over the last decade, half in the United States, half outside, that show that for every dollar you spend at a locally owned enterprise, you get two to four times the jobs and other economic development impacts as you would get at non-locally owned businesses. Significantly, there is not a single study ever published that has shown otherwise. Don't take my word for it, in the Harvard Business Review, in the summer of 2010, this article, More Small Firms Means More Jobs. It's a regression analysis of 200 metro areas in the United States. And what it found is that per capita job growth was positively correlated with the presence of local small business. And then another study done at the universe at, at Pennsylvania State a few months later found that per capita income growth also was correlated with the presence of locally owned business. So it contributes to social equality as well. There's a vast literature that I don't have time to share with you, except if you want to, you can read about some of it in my earlier books. But a vast literature that shows that local businesses are key for smart growth. If you want walkability, you need smaller and increasingly home-based businesses. If you want good tourism, you want unique local businesses that attract tourists. If you want entrepreneurship, you want more people starting and growing small businesses. There's a literature that says that public health is positively benefited by all of the kinds of economic benefits that come out of local business. There's a sociology literature that shows that local business communities has, have less civic strike, civic strife and better marketplaces. And there's a political science literature that shows that local business communities have higher degrees of voter participation and volunteerism. So there's a very, very huge body of evidence about why locally owned businesses are the best form of economic development. Point two, the most prosperous community is going to be the one that is as self-reliant as possible. Now this flies in the face of conventional economic development that says prosperity is rooted in maximizing trade. So let me be clear, what I am talking about is the combination of local self-reliance and trade. The best community is going to be selling as much stuff as it can to the world and as much stuff as it can to itself. Global markets, local markets, that's the whole thing. Take one of those things away and you lose something. And the mistake of economic development is the assertion that if you just focus on the global side of the picture, the local side takes care of itself. And in point of fact, what we know is the causality works in exactly the opposite direction. That if you focus on local businesses, nurturing them, growing them, many of them will naturally start looking to global markets. And they won't need subsidies to get there. I'll give you an example of what I mean. This headline comes from the International Herald Tribune. It says, dead end Austrian town blossoms with green energy. And it's the story of Gusing. Gusing is an Austrian town of 3,000 people, had a history of forestry and agriculture. As the European community opened up, they had a lot of difficulty. They elected a mayor in 1995 who said, the key to our prosperity is to be self-reliant in something. They decided to focus on energy. So they created a district heating system with wood from the old forestry industry, and in doing so became a little bit less dependent on outside imports of oil and natural gas and coal. They got wealthier. 
And they took that wealth and then they reinvested it in a second energy business. And then another, and another, and another. 15 years later, Goosen created 50 new energy businesses. And this 3,000 person town created 1,000 new jobs rooted in energy. Partially self-reliance, partially the export of energy. And in doing so, reduced its carbon footprint 95%. Here's another story, closer to my home. A delicatessen, Zingerman's. For many years, Zingerman's was a reasonably successful delicatessen. But then they came to a kind of fork in the road about whether they were going to become a national chain. They, were, they decided against it for two reasons. One is they prided themselves in quality control. They were afraid they would lose it if they started creating chain businesses all over the place. As one of the founders, Paul Saginaw, says, I don't want to spend the rest of my retirement visiting second-rate versions of myself. <laughs> the other reason was that what they really enjoyed was coming to work and schmoozing with the people that they knew. The people, the relationships, is what gave them joy. So they decided they were not leaving Ann Arbor. But rather than grow broad, they would grow deep. So they looked at things coming into the deli and said, what kinds of new businesses could we grow around it? And they thought, OK, we have bread for sandwiches. We could create a bakery. We have cheese and ice cream. We could create a creamery. We have great food. We could actually then take that food and create a sit-down restaurant uh, called The Roadhouse. We have great coffee cakes. We could create a mail order coffee cake company. We have great customer service. We could create a training module for customer service for other companies. So in all, Zingerman's is now nine independently owned businesses. The partners of these businesses meet together and co-license the brand. Zingerman's uh, grew into a network of businesses that today provide 550 jobs in Ann Arbor and have sales over $35 million a year. What I think is interesting about Zingerman's is that economic development would have said it was impossible. Because economic development says you focus on clusters of strength and you build on those clusters. So, you know, if you're a mining community, you do more mining and you do more value added on the mining. Zingerman's was not a cluster of food activity. It had bupkis going on in food. But they built a cluster from scratch. And that's a lot of what transition towns work is all about. It's building clusters of strength and basic needs from scratch. Rule number three. This is sort of stating the obvious, but you have to identify great models of triple bottom line success and spread them. Now I understand that in your country as well as mine, there's a lot of difference of opinion as you move around the country about what constitutes the right level of environmental protection or the right level of labor rights. But here's what I know there's an absolute consensus on. If I say to a community, would you rather have full employment with a good state of environmental protection or would you rather have full employment with bad environmental protection, it's a no-brainer. They all agree. They would like it all. Why not have it all? The only way you can have it all is if you systematically, as part of economic development, identify those businesses that are profitable, that have high labor and environmental standards, identify them, celebrate them, spread their practices, and get other businesses to follow. It's an affirmative part of economic development practice. Now, I have to say that the only objections that I get to what I've just shared with you really come down to competitiveness. 
many economic developers will say to me, okay, Schumann, you're right. We have two apples here, a local apple, a non-local apple, same price, same convenience. Uh, both of them are same quality. Of course, that local apple will get you all of these benefits. But these apples are never the same. Bigger is better. Bigger box is cheaper. Bigger business achieve better economies of scale. So a lot of what I spent my last book, The Small Mart Revolution, focusing on was why those arguments were all wrong. But I want to just share a couple of things with you. If it were true that local small businesses have become less competitive in the United States, we would have seen the share of jobs moving from small business to large business. And in point of fact, here is the record between 1990 and 2009. The red blob is large business, which occupies uh, a little less than 50% of the jobs in the private sector. And if you had a magnifying glass, you would find that large businesses grew in their market share by about 2%. Now, two things to say about this. First of all, 2% is not very big. And this was in an environment where economic development was systematically biased in favor of global companies against local small business. Imagine if economic development had not declared war on local business. This never would have happened. You wouldn't have even had a 2% growth of large market share. It shows how resilient the sector is, is that despite the best efforts of economic development to kill local small business through anti-competitive behavior, they did very well. The other point that I would make is this is jobs. It doesn't take into account the explosion of home-based businesses in the United States. And when you put that into account, these trends are all reversed. And actually, local small businesses have expanded their market share. In your country, in Australia, the small and medium businesses don't constitute half the economy. They constitute 70%. And the same story applies there. Now, what about profitability? It turns out that in the United States, sole proprietorships, which most small businesses are or start out as, are three times as profitable as C corporations, with partnerships falling somewhere in between. And if you think local businesses are profitable now, you ain't seen nothing yet. As Peter pointed out, you know, we're facing a world where oil prices, energy prices, are likely to get significantly higher. And what this means, among other things, is that a lot of long distance importing of manufactured goods is no longer going to make sense. And we will be rebuilding a lot of manufacturing industries closer to markets. Now, when I think about how one promotes local economic development, there's kind of a six key agenda that comes to mind. Planning people, partners, purse purchasing, and policy making. Planning means identifying all those places in your economy where people are unnecessarily buying outside goods and services because those unnecessary imports represent money leaking out of your economy. If you can plug those leaks with new import substituting business, you can grow the economy and pump up the local multiplier. People, how do you support a new generation of local entrepreneurs? Partners, how do we create networks of local business that are more competitive together than they would be just competing against one another. For example, in Tucson, Arizona, something called Tucson Originals is a group of food businesses that collectively buy foodstuffs and kitchen equipment and thereby bring down their costs through collaboration. Purse, how do you bring capital into local businesses? Purchasing, how do you get consumers to buy more local more of the time, buy local, think local first campaigns? 
And policy making. I have a simple goal for public policy. Stop destroying local business. Just have a competitive marketplace and we'll do just fine, thank you. So I must say, in the last five years, you know, I do 40, 50 of these talks a year. Uh, and the feedback that I get from small businesses all across the country, in the United States, but even outside the country, is how difficult it is for them to access capital. And that's why I focused uh, the last few years of my work and my last book on what are new ways of bringing capital into local business. So now we get to the hard part. You. I think it's fair to say that we have a fairly dedicated locavore group from Sydney and outside of Sydney. So my fellow locavores, by show of hands, how many of you do your banking at a local bank or credit union? OK, so a fairly significant number. By show of hands, how many of you invest your super funds, your pension funds, in local small business? OK, two of you. Now, notice the difference. Two people in this room of the biggest locavores of Sydney are investing their super funds in local small business. This is a disgrace. This is a disgrace. We can discuss this shortly. Well, th this is my point. Thank you for making my point. You can't do it. You can't do it. We have a total capital market failure. Seventy percent of your business is local small business. We've just established that they're remarkably competitive. They're profitable. They're becoming increasingly competitive. A properly operating capital marketplace would put 70% of your long-term assets into local small business. And almost none of it is going into local small business. It means every one of you is systematically over-investing in the global companies you distrust and under-investing, frankly, neglecting 100% the local businesses you care passionately about. We've got to fix this problem. The reason why we have this problem is this guy, the accredited investor. That's what we call wealthy investors in the United States. And during, during the Great Depression, 80 years ago, we in the United States, and to some extent you in Australia, created a system of securities law that I would regard as a system of investor apartheid. If you are a wealthy individual, you can invest in anything, anytime, anywhere, no questions asked. If you are not this kind of person, you may not invest, usually, and now I'll speak about the United States context, unless a lawyer has prepared a private placement memorandum that could easily cost twenty-five or $50,000, and if many of you wanted to put money into a small business, they would have to do a public offering statement that might cost another $50,000. Is it worth it for a small business to create, uh, to get $1 of investment from a bunch of people for $100,000 of lawyer's bills? Forget it. We did this to protect grandma from buying swamp land in Florida, to protect her from fraud. But what does fraud protection look, look like? It means we get a thick book, a disclosure statement that a lawyer has prepared in eight-point font that no human being has ever been observed to read. And every single page says, you will lose everything. You will lose everything. That's what disclosure has become. It's a nutty system. So we in the United States have been thinking about alternatives. Why think about the alternatives? Because think of the potential. Now, Australia has $1.3 million in super funds right now. Three, three trillion, thank you. 1.3 trillion. 
If you were able to move that money into 70% of the economy, which is local small business and medium-sized local business, that would be a trillion dollar shift. A trillion dollars works out to $40,000 for every man, woman, and child in Australia. Think of what your community could do with that kind of new capital coming into your communities. So how do we make this happen? How do we tap the investment dollars of the 99% of people who are non-wealthy? So I want to quickly run through 10 ways that we have tapped into the 99% in the United States. Number one, specialty certificates of deposit. We have examples of Americans who go to their local bank and say, I know you're not comfortable lending to a bunch of businesses right now. Here's what we want you to do. Create a special savings instrument, the proceeds of which can only be used to provide a loan to local businesses we really care about. Here's an example. Equal Exchange is a fair trade coffee company. They exist in Boston. They approach their local bank, Wainwright, now Eastern, and they convince them to create a fair trade certificate of deposit. They now have a $1 million credit line as a result of people loving to buy the CDs linked with fair trade. Number two, co-op investment. In both Australia and the United States, co-ops have long been viewed as excused from some, not all, of the requirements of securities laws. So, for example, if you're one of 13,000 members of the Weaver Street Co-op in Carborough, North Carolina, they're, the, they're now building a third store. They need a million dollars. They decide to borrow that money from their members. So in addition to your member capital that you get some rate of return on, you can lend money to the co-op and get a 5, 6, 7, 8 percent rate of return for the privilege of giving them a big chunk of money. So this is a very common form of local investment in the United States. Number three, LION. LION stands for the Local Investment Opportunities Network of Port Townsend, Washington, started by the guy on the right. James Fraser, a former guilt-ridden hedge fund manager. <laughs> Lyon addresses a peculiar problem in securities law in both your country and in mine. And that is, short of a public offering, if I want to get you to invest in my company, and I've done all of my good legal paperwork, I still can't talk to you unless you and I have a pre-existing relationship. So what James Fraser does is he throws a party once a month in Port Townsend, brings investors to the party, brings businesses to the party, gets them snockered, and at the end of the party, he passes around a list and say, who have you talked to? And now we have a list of pre-existing relationships. And that determines who he hands the business plans to since 2008, that is since the financial meltdown, this 10,000 person town through Lyon has actually financed $3 million worth of new business at the local level, thanks to Lyon. This is a concept that is now spreading across the United States. Number four, sponsorship sites. This is Kickstarter. This is an offering of Kickstarter to support a brewery in, uh, in uh, Copper Harbor. Now, Kickstarter does not pay you a rate of return. If you give the brewery a buck, they give, send you a thank you note. If you give them 25 bucks, they send you a t-shirt. If you give them 1,000 bucks, maybe they'll name the beer after you. <laughs> the Securities and Exchange Commission does not regard these as securities, so you're home free. Now, economists would say, who would give away something for nothing? No one in their right mind would. Except Kickstarter last year actually raised $100 million for US companies. And there's a bunch of sites like it. We have this proliferation of 
lending sites, peer-to-peer -peer lending sites. Kiva.org is Muhammad Yunus in electronic version uh, that allows you to give a microloan to an entrepreneur in the global south and also in some inner city communities in the United States. The thing about Kiva in the United States is they don't pay back interest, they just pay back the principal. And in most states in the United States, that does not constitute a security and is not regulated. Now, Prosper will pay you interest on loans that you might give to other peers in, in the country or outside the country, and that is a security, but Prosper has done all the securities work to facilitate that. And so we're seeing these kinds of funds beginning to make their way on the Australian scene as well. Just a word of caution. What I worry about with these sites is they're not focused on local investing. That every dollar you put into a micro-entrepreneur in Bolivia is a dollar unavailable for a micro-entrepreneur in Sydney. So I think it's important to start thinking about how to do workarounds with these sites to focus on community-based investing. And an example is the funding circle in the United Kingdom, which creates community-based networks around Birmingham, Manchester, and so forth, and brings together companies and investors in those places. Number six, pre-selling. In the United States, selling goods in advance in most of our states is not regarded as a security. So Awaken Cafe, which needed $100,000 to move to a new store site in Oakland, decided they don't want to waste $100,000 on lawyers. So they decided to pre-sell coffee. Here was the deal. You could plunk down $1,000 today, and once the new store opens up, you get $1,200 worth of coffee. This is how they financed their store. Number seven, now we get into the fun stuff, local stock. In the United States, we have kind of two systems of securities law, federal and state. And it's possible to issue publicly traded stock at the state level that only people living in a state can buy, which is effectively a form of localization. This is the Merck, or the Mercantile, in Powell, Wyoming. The Merck existed because the residents of Powell, Wyoming had no place to buy socks and underwear. They needed a general store. They needed a couple of hundred thousand dollars to start the general store, so they got volunteer legal assistance. They were able to create a local stock issue and they sold it door to door like Girl Scout cookies. This thing got financed. And this has been profitable every year for the last 10 years. There are now busloads of tourists that come into Powell, Wyoming to see the story of the Powell Merck miracle. Because people, once they own the local store, where do they do their shopping? At the local store. Now, the key thing about this is this happened because of volunteer legal assistance. This made me think. It's not a good system. We got to think about another system. And here's what really started to make me mad. In the United States, we have 1,000 casinos. And remember, you know, I, I mentioned before that the whole purpose of securities law is to prevent grandma from losing her life savings on the swampland in Florida. But grandma can walk into any one of the thousand casinos in the United States. And when she walks through the door, do they say, excuse me, grandma, but can you show us that you're an accredited gambler? <laughs> no. And when grandma sits down at the blackjack table, do they say, uh, before you start playing, can you look at this big disclosure document on the risks of blackjack? No. So we have two systems of protecting the American public. One system called gambling, where you can lose everything for nothing and probably will, independent of your income. And another system called saving your economy through local investment, and sorry, you can't do it. 
unless you pay off lawyers an unnecessary $100,000. This made me very upset. So I wrote a piece for the Federal Reserve Journal suggesting, mischievously, admittedly, a $100 exemption. That we should just allow people to put $100 into anything they want, any time they want, no questions asked. Some people got very interested in this and started writing petitions to the SEC saying, um, please give us a $100 exemption. Hundreds of letters came in. A year ago, the chairman, chairwoman of the SEC, Mary Shapiro, was sitting before a committee in Capitol Hill, and they asked her, um, Ms. Shapiro, you've gotten a bunch of reform proposals over the years. Whatever happened to this $100 exemption proposal? And she kind of hemmed and hawed uncomfortably in her seat and said, well, we may call together a committee to start studying this in six months or so. Uh, you know, there's a little bit of interest in it. The committee went ballistic. We are in a 9% unemployment jobs crisis in the United States, and you're calling a committee in six months to study something that's been on the table for three years? They voted unanimously to create not a $100 exemption, but a $10,000 exemption. And the Congress voted 99% of the Congress voted in favor of this bill, Republicans and Democrats together. It went to the Senate, where it got whittled back down to $2,000 per person. But uh, I was pleased to sit in the Rose Garden in April with 300 other people when President Obama signed the jobs bill. And while it is an imperfect act, here's the one thing it does it legalizes local investment and makes it possible for every single American to put up to $2,000 per year in a company they love with very little legal paperwork. And I feel like, you know, I have been affiliated in my life with losing causes year after year. And to have finally get one thing right was so hard to me. You gotta do it here too. I mean, Paul will lay out some of the issues as he sees them, but you've got to do it here, too. But we're not done, because it's not enough to issue a bunch of local securities. You've got to make it easy for people to buy and sell them. So we're going to start to see the emergence of local stock markets. This guy, Michael Van Patten of Mission Markets, has a platform that he's prepared to deploy in your neighborhood or your state for fifty dollars to $100,000. The first buyer may well be the state of Hawaii, which last year passed a piece of legislation demanding a local stock exchange for the state in the name of economic development. The guy on the right has a local stock market idea in Lancaster, Pennsylvania called the Lanax. He thinks $100,000 is too expensive. Um, interestingly, his name is Trexler Profit. Now, no one should take what I'm saying here as a recommendation that you should put all of your life savings into any business you love. It's too risky. We want to create diversified funds so that people can hedge risk and invest wisely in local businesses. The problem is, is that in our country, the securities laws around investment companies are even worse than those around the issuing of stock. Again, if you're an unaccredited investor, keep out. You can't play. Well, we do have a system of mutual funds, and if you spend about half a million dollars on lawyers' fees, you can create a mutual fund that unaccredited investors can put money into. We have 7,500 mutual funds in the United States. Not a single one invests in local small business. They're not legally prohibited from doing so. They just choose not to do so. So really, the only options we have right now for funds are there are some nonprofits, like Steve Fireman in Columbus, Ohio, has the Economic and Community Development Institute, a revolving loan fund that unaccredited investors can put money into, and it supports local small business. In the meantime, what we can do 
And what you can do, too, is use a secret weapon called the self-directed IRA, or the self-directed super. In our country, this is so secret that a dummy's book has been written about it. <laughs> but here's the thing. If I shift my money from my vanilla-flavored IRA, which can only invest in Fortune 500 companies, into my own IRA, I can invest in all of the things we just talked about. I can invest in co-ops and lend money to my co-op. I can put money on deposit for my favorite local businesses through CDs at my local bank. I can invest in local stock, local stock markets, Steve Fireman's fund. I can invest in an investment club. I can invest in local real estate. The only thing I can't invest in is my own house or my kid's house. But I can invest in my neighbor's house. And my neighbor can invest in my house. And therein lies my talk for next year. <laughs> in the meantime, I just point this out that, you know, in the absence of diversified funds, the ambitious local investor can create your own local fund, you know, with a modest fee each year through a self-directed IRA or self-directed super. Will you ever make money with local investment? If you have a loser social life like I do, you will be sitting home on Saturday listening to AM radio in Washington, D.C., and hearing investment advisors like Rick Edelman tell you, leave your money in Wall Street 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and you will get 8%, no 10%, no 12%, no 20%. These numbers are all pure crap, pure crap. Because if you look at the historic performance of Wall Street, remove inflation, remove all the tricks they do with reinvestment, the average return, annual return on Wall Street over 140 years in real dollars has been 2.6%. Now, I haven't done the math in Australia, but here's what I know. Your index funds right now are about at the same value they were in 2007. So something isn't working great here either. I suggest that local investments can do just fine against Wall Street investment. And in fact, some of the examples that I gave to you, like Equal Exchange uh, or Weaver Street Market, they pay well over 5% per year. Here's the bottom line. We are seeing a historic transformation, a historic transformation where investment apartheid that has been the law of our lands is beginning to give way to kind of a democratization of capital. And the dam that's held back money from the 99% to the vast majority of businesses that are local, small, and important for economic development is about to burst open. What happens in the United States when the first trillion dollars moves from Wall Street to Main Street? Prices of stocks on Wall Street with less demand go down. And prices on Main Street securities go up. And people sit up and take notice. Then the next trillion moves, and the next, and the next. This process could move very quickly once we set the mechanics in motion. So where I want to leave you and where I end my book, um, Local Dollars, Local Sense, is with a children's story called A Blue So Blue by Jean-Francois Dumont. And I think it's a compelling story because it, it's the story of how we as investors so often seek wealth by going far away and ignoring the obvious. And it's a story of a kid who's obsessed with painting the color blue. He loves the color blue. But there's one shade of blue that comes to him in his dreams, has mesmerized him, and he can't figure out where that color of blue is. So he sets out on a global journey to find the color blue. He goes to the Louvre, looks around the paintings there. No, can't find it. Goes on an ocean journey looking for that shade of blue in patches of the ocean. 
It doesn't find it there. It goes to a blues bar in New Orleans. Nope, not there. It goes to a desert, and there a blue-hooded stranger says, what you've been looking for may never have been that far away. And suddenly it dawns on the boy. The blue was in his mother's eyes. We ignore the obvious. We ignore the wealth that is in our own backyards. And hopefully, as a result of meetings like today's, we can begin to set the table straight and put our money in the things that really count. Thank you very much.